all you lovely people. I thought what we could do today, as it's such a, <laughs> a wintry February day, we could talk about um, RBG's sort of like new rose garden. I would say it's new. It was put in the ground in, in 2018, I guess. Um, but, you know, lots of like lovely things to come as the season develops and as the roses start to grow. Um, a particular focus of this talk is the sustainability aspect of, of the rose garden which we were keen to incorporate right from the get-go. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the history of the old Rose Garden, some of the decision-making um, processes we had to go through, uh, and some of the outcomes of the decision-making that we made in installing this new garden. So to give this thing a little bit of context, this is me, I'm Alex, I'm the Curator of Living Collections at RBG. I've been in this role since 2006. And this is probably my first garden job. Um, I should point out that I'm still waiting for payment from my parents. It's ongoing. They don't seem to want to pay me for this. Um, but uh, I've always been keen on gardens and being outside. And when when I was a, a small kid growing up, um, for whatever reason, I was always like really keen on lilacs, tulips, and Japanese flowering cherries. So like, you know, working at RBG is really a a dream come true because we have all of these represented in our in our collections in the in the various garden areas so uh, and, and as you can see from this picture as i've just previously mentioned I, i'm a big advocate for being outdoors and uh, i love the environment and i love gardens and i love plants and i, I love nature in general so uh, i'm lucky to be in the job that i'm in so this is Hendry Park. This is the garden that's opposite RBG Centre. And this picture was taken in 1963. And really the development of Hendry Park started around about this time uh, with a big kind of like focus on having this garden being prepared for 1967. And of course, 1967 was Canada's centennial anniversary. Um, so one of the big things that uh, they wanted to include in that garden was a rose garden because, you know, most botanic gardens around the world have roses in some form or another. And in this picture in the, if you can just see where my uh, mouse cursor is moving, you can see here the footprint of the original rose garden as it was being graded and moved along from the previous picture. So the, these are the beds that the roses were going to be planted in. So as you can see, it's quite a large area. And this is Plains Road and RBG Centre would be here with the tunnel going through. So, And by 1967, when the garden was graded and the design was finalised, around about 5,000 roses were planted in the spring of that year in order that the centennial celebration would be a really, a really wonderful opportunity to showcase roses and um, Canadian horticulture. And after a few years and the, the garden had developed, this picture was taken in the uh, early 1970s. Really the, the scope of the Rose Garden at that point was just to display the, the whole diversity of the different rose classes, uh, put on a really, really good colorful display. And as you can see, it's a pretty spectacular feature in the landscape. And just to give you some context about roses, um, you know, th this is kind of going into the horticultural nerd world, but, you know, roses first appeared in the fossil record around about 35 million years ago. Uh, and species roses evolved naturally and adapted to their habitat and were extremely resilient. They kind of like evolved originally sort of like in the Middle East uh, around what you would uh, historically have called Persia and, and those areas. So they were kind of like evolved in quite tough uh, growing conditions, um, you know, quite quite arid growing conditions. And so they were, they were really highly evolved to, to withstand climate, uh, tough growing conditions uh, and be, be very resilient plants, in fact, which you, you may not necessarily think about roses in a modern context. But, you know, a key date in the history of roses was in 1867 when Jean-Baptiste Guillot um, crossed a hybrid perpetual rose and a tea rose to create the first modern rose, which was called La France. And this really provides a dividing line between what we class as heritage roses and modern roses. And you can see La France here in the picture. It's a very, very beautiful flower. When it was first introduced, there was nothing else like it. It really took the, 
the horticulture world by storm and it really sort of influenced in a, in a really large degree rose hybridizing for, for several years to come. Um, but one of the, the key things about this 1867 bit is that, and this new new hybridization of roses, is that many modern roses have now lost the natural disease resistant of the species roses and heritage roses. So, you know, we've done a complete turnaround in the fact that the, the original wild adapted roses were extremely resilient to, to modern roses now, which have lost that resilience. So. Uh, and instead of being bred for resilience, uh, they were really bred for this iconic kind of like flower shape that we see in La France. So, you know, in plant hybridization, there's always a, a, a trade off with anything that you do. Uh, and in this case, it was resilience versus, I guess, what you would call aesthetic beauty. So if we look back through the history of roses, um, we can classify roses into the, the the classes that have good genetics and the bad genetics. So uh, the good genetics would include species roses, Gallica, Damask, Alba, Centifolia, Moss, China Portland and Bourbon roses, many of which are still available today and will still, still grow extremely sustainably in gardens. Uh, and then we get to this key point, 1867 and La France, which introduces hybrid perpetual, hybrid tea, polyantha, floribunda, and grandiflora roses, and and these are the roses that took the the rose world by storm. Many of these are, you know, still some of the most popular types of rose classes, uh, and uh, the, these are what we would class as the roses that have the bad genetics because of that hybridization trade-off. And really, when we talk about bad genetics in roses, what we're immediately looking at is a disease called black spot and this is a fungal disease which infects leaves of roses and it drastically drastically reduces the the vigor if, if you're uh, a rose enthusiast and you grow roses in your garden uh, I would imagine you're quite familiar with with the look of, of black spot which is typically this black spot in on the leaves uh, in some cases you, you get black spots surrounded by yellow patches you get discolored leaves in the middle picture here, this is a picture that we took in our old rose garden. I took this picture in about, uh, I would say, I want to say about 2012. And this picture was taken sort of like late July, early April. And you can basically see there are no roses on the, uh, no leaves on the roses at all. Uh, they've all fallen because of black spot. There's very little flowers on the roses because of the reduced vigor, because they can't, the plant can't photosynthesize because of the, the leaf loss. Um, and Anecdotally, you know, people have been saying now that black spot has been blamed significantly for a decline in the popular popularity of rose growing in, in recent decades. And certainly, you know, since, since moving to, to Ontario in 2006, the number of rose nurseries has certainly dropped and disappeared. Uh, and all, all of that is basically because of this one particular disease, black spot and, and bad genetics in roses. So, however, we'll, we'll uh, We'll look at some new roses shortly that have got good genetics, which are sort of like taking over from these older roses. So the, the whole problem with black spot is that you really need to treat it with chemicals, like with, with, the cop, with copper sprays and, and things like that. And in 2009, Ontario brought in a cosmetic pesticide ban on April the 22nd. And this was sort of like introduced overnight um, so it didn't give a lot of people time to adapt. And, you know, prior, prior to 2009, uh, IBG was never really using a lot of um, herbicides, pesticides, uh, fungicides. We, we were using them to a minimum, but I would say that the one collection that we did need to use fungicides on and, and uh, pesticides was really the rose collection because of these roses with bad genetics. And just, just to give you... A, an overview of the, the pesticide ban. This meant that uh, pesticides could no longer be used for cosmetic purposes on lawns or vegetables or ornamental gardens and patios, driveways, cemeteries, parks, even schoolyards. And really the only people that were allowed to opt out of this were um, golfing places, golf greens and uh, golf courses, so, which, which was a, a little strange, but um, you know, that, that's the situation. We wanted to comply with the ban because we want to be an environmental institution. And as I mentioned, we weren't using much of this product anyway. 
but for the Rosas, it did have a have a, a major impact. Um, and so, you know, the black spot challenge that we had in the Rose collection from 2009 on really, really became more of a challenge. It became unsustainable. Uh, and it was a very difficult situation to manage the Rose collection, especially especially from a staff morale kind of version, because we, we wanted to you know, be doing something that was beautiful, that would impress our visitors and supporters, and, and we weren't really doing that. But, you know, the, the whole um, black spot situation was com further compounded with several other cha challenges. So um, we were using poor irrigation practices. So we had pop-up sprinklers that would come out of the turf that surrounded the rose beds. Uh, and that was really to water the, the, the turf paths, but the water would be sprinkled onto the rose leaves. And when water hits rose leaves that have got black spot, it tends to spread it even more. So we were really on the losing side with the irrigation practices. So um, when you looked at the soil in the rose garden, it was very um, impoverished. Uh, it was very tired. Um, you know, if you keep planting roses into the same soil year after year after year, you can become susceptible to a disease called rose replant disorder. And this is where you plant a rose back into the soil where a rose was previously grown and it just won't thrive. So it's not dissimilar from the, the theory of, um, you know, rotating crops in, in horticulture. You don't grow the same crops in the same field year after year after year. So um, we were also growing disease susceptible cultivars, so cultivated varieties of, of roses that had the, the poor genetics that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, and we had a large contingent of hybrid teen Floribunda roses in the garden, which were extremely um, black spot prone. And I guess around, I think it was in December 2013, we had an extremely severe ice storm. Uh, and we didn't realize the, the, the extent of the damage until spring in 2014. And it became quickly apparent that uh, pretty much half the collection of roses had been killed off. And if you try to, to, to acquire roses in April, uh, any year in particular, it's very difficult because they're already sold out. Um, so it's very difficult to replace the roses. And from really that point on, it was almost like we were managing the, the rose garden as if it was an annual garden. We're having to replant it every year. We're having to find roses, you know, to fill the gaps. And uh, it was it was a ever decreasing circle and it was really impacting on labor budgets and, and staff morale. And on top of that, we also had soil fertility issues because we've been, you know, applying, you know, inorganic fertilizers onto the roses for, for 50 years. Well, you know, at that point, 45 years. Um, and again, it led back to this um, soil, soil, this impoverished soil that was not really full of any kind of like nutrients. So uh, there was a lot of challenges going on with the rose garden at that point. And this is this is what the model of the garden looked like. So uh, you can see we had all these formal beds. Um, each of these beds contained about 35 individual roses of the same cultivated variety. So if you lost half a bed due to black spot or winter kill or um, just, you know, the, the poorness of the soil, it's very difficult to find a lot of roses to fill those beds. So it was becoming an increasingly difficult challenge to, to, to manage this horticulturally. So, you know, I guess by around about um, 2015, we were really asking some fundamental questions. And uh, one of the fundamental questions was, given, given the state of um, our rose collection, given the fact that there are very many rose nurseries out there, given the fact that we, we lack capacity staff-wise because we're a, we're a not-for-profit institution. Uh, one of the fundamental questions is, should we actually carry on growing roses because the situation was, was that serious? Uh, and we, we had this conversation for a while, and then we discovered uh, this book uh, by a, a very nice gentleman called Peter Kukelski, and it's called Roses Without Chemicals. And we quickly realized this was a, a really uh, a game-changing book on roses because it's uh, 150 disease-free varieties that will change the way you grow roses. So um, Peter had been 
the rose curator at the Peggy Rockefeller Rose Collection at New York Botanical Garden uh, in New York. And they'd gone through a similar situation in, um, I believe it was like the late 90s where New York introduced the pesticide ban. So as the curator there, he was in the same situation that RBG was in. Uh, and he managed to figure out how to create a sustainable rose garden with roses with good genetics. And so what we decided to do was rather than reinvent the wheel, hire him as a, as a sort of like uh, a contractor for us and to guide us through how we might think about creating a, a rose garden for the 21st century. So, uh, and we engaged with him and he gave us a lot of advice and he came up with a new design. So, and this is what the new design looks like now. So it's in, it's in the same area as the previous rose garden it's it's a lot smaller there are no beds on the outside here these beds are uh, they're, they're larger but they're easier to manage so there's less labor in the garden um so this was a, a big step forward but you know the design's one thing but uh, what kind of roses did we want to grow sustainably so that was a big question and so um we had several questions for him and, and straight away you know one of the things that we wanted to do was to try to grow roses that don't require any degree of chemical input at all and that are easier to maintain than the the previous roses uh, and he had a lot of advice about that and we'll look at that as the slide deck goes on and he also um we also wanted to include beautiful color combinations we wanted to pay attention to texture growth habit and flower forms. So in the previous rose garden, we would say like, take a rose like this and plant 35 of them in a single bed. So you're just seeing the same rose on mass. In the new garden, what we've done is we've taken a rose like this, planted it next to that and planted it next to that. So you get a transition in flower form, flower color, height, um, all, all kinds of like uh, morphological things with the with the way that the roses look. So it's a, it's a lot more interesting on the eye. So we wanted pleasing color transitions between the beds too. So not just between the roses individually, but throughout the entire garden. Um, one of the big decisions that we had to make was, um, as I mentioned previously, this notion of um, rose replant disorder and the impoverished soil. So this this was a two point six million dollar project, and the last thing I wanted to do was to be planting all these fantastic new roses into the previous soil. So we uh, we had to argue in the in the budget composition to have the the old soil replaced and new soil brought in, and that that was the single most expensive line item on the budget. But it was really really well thought out because it gave the roses a great start. Uh, and the other, like probably the most major decision that we had to make was, do we want to grow roses as a monoculture uh, in the previous um, example of the old rose garden, or do we want to include some other things? And so we decided early on that we wanted to include some companion plants to attract beneficial insects, and also do things like extend the, the seasonal interest of the bed. So those, those were some initial ideas we we had for the garden and like working with Pete we were able to slowly flesh out these ideas which was very very exciting working on a on a rose garden that could potentially be sustainable based on the on the previous model of the garden and uh, we had some specific choices for um the the selection of roses for the garden and uh, again this was where Pete was a really big help for us so again, some of the goals were we wanted to acquire um, roses with genetics specifically hybridized for disease resistance, so plants that were resistant to black spot in, in particular. We used the personal data collected by Peter Kukowski in, in his um, creation of the New York Botanic Rose Garden. So, you know, he, th this information was basically what was in his book. Um, we looked at roses that had performed well on the previous um, rose garden site at RBG, and you know an example of that would be the rose Julia Child, which is a very beautiful um, yellow rose, and it never, never ever got black spots. So you, you know, that would be considered a, a rose with superior genetics. And we also travelled around the local area and connected with partners such as Palatine Roses, JC Backers, and Bioland Research and Innovation Centre. 
who all had really, really great advice for us for, for um, roses that would grow well in the area. And we also um, reached out to, to like local rose societies in, in the, the Golden Horseshoe to look at what they advise were regionally well adapted roses to. So as you can see, there was a lot of thought process that went into this garden. It wasn't just a case of, oh, we'd like to create something beautiful. It's uh, more of a case, we'd like to create something that's beautiful, but that is really um, resilient and environmentally well adapted. Uh, so that we can manage this in a, in a completely different way, in a, in a more environmental and an earth kind way. So again, some further environmental considerations for this garden were thinking about how we would like to irrigate the, the collection, because as I previously mentioned, the sprinkler irrigation we used before um, really helped spread black spot in the garden. So as opposed to going to drip irrigation, we decided to put low drip irrigation pipes directly on the on the soil surface so and this has a, a huge advantages because it, it delivers the water directly to the soil surface and therefore to the roots it doesn't splash to the leaves so it doesn't spread black spot and because it's low drip irrigation you're using vast vastly less amounts of water um, so you, you can improve your stewardship of water resources and and this, the irrigation system so sophisticated that we can actually audit the amount of, of water that we use. Um, and the whole intention for using this low volume drip irrigation system was to um, just use it for the first year after planting uh, and then not to use it afterwards unless it was in periods of extreme drought. Uh, and that's partly to do with the, with the planting style that we used and so like most roses have a graft union a lot of roses are, are grafted they have a rootstock and a, and a scion and they're grafted together and traditionally you would plant that graft union kind of like around about the soil level what we did with these roses is we've planted the graft union two inches below the soil level because that provides um protection from from cold conditions in the winter and it helps prevent um you know, desiccation due due to um, hot summer temperatures. So, and that meant that uh, they require less water. So the low volume drip irrigation was perfect for this. So, um, we also wanted to reduce the abuse and misuse of inorganic fertilizers uh, because this reduces groundwater contamination. Uh, and if you think about where the Rose Garden is in Hendry Park, it's right next to Hendry Valley, which is a, a very sort of like biodiverse natural area with native flora. Um, so we didn't want to be, you know, creating nitrate runoff that would alter the ecosystem down there. So uh, we wanted to get rid of using fertilizers completely. Uh, and one of the ways that we um, did that was to, to think about the soil and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as, as the slide deck goes on and of course we wanted to completely do away with the use of pesticides and fungicides and you know aside from wanting to have roses with better genetics not using pesticides and fungicides is better for RBG staff it's better for garden visitors it ultimately creates a healthier soil it shows us to it allows us to educate about better environmental management practices and it complies with the cosmetic pesticide ban, which is great. So um, some great, great uh, in interpretive like stories that we can share with people when they come and visit the garden. So, yeah, this also allowed us to with the soil exchange because we, we removed the soil down to a, a level of 18 inches. Uh, and that helps reduce the, the potential for rose replant disorder. Uh, and it allowed us to bring in new soil and that allowed us to really create a balanced pH for the roses, which is, is important. It allowed us to remove that buildup of synthetic fertilizer and chemical residues that had you know, acquired over 50 years. Um, it provided the opportunity to replace old drainage lines, which were perhaps broken and install new irrigation systems. So along with the, um, the, the drainage and the irrigation, we're really, really managing water in a much more environmentally um, better sense. And we also it allowed us to encourage a healthier soil soup. So, you know, 
one of the ways that I always explain this is if you're walking through a, a forest in, in the fall, you see the leaves fall and then they, you know, degrade over the coming growing season. And it's that degradation that puts the nutrients and the goodness back in the soil. So why would we not be doing that with the rose garden and encouraging a healthier soil? So um, when we when we put the new soil in the ground, we included a lot of organic matter. Um, we included beneficial mycorrhizae, which are sort of like um, it's a microscopic fungi that help improve plant health by um, allowing the roots of the roses and the companion plants to to get more nutrients out of the soil and one of the really big things that we did was um, we decided to uh, apply a three inch layer of mulch every year um, what the mulch does is it helps it prevents weed growth it keeps moisture in the soil but when you apply a three inch layer of mulch it, it degrades over the season much in the same way as the leaf litter in the in the forest uh, floor uh, and it's really the mulch that feeds the plants and the roses and that means we don't have to use any inorganic um, fertilizers so you know this is just a, a much more environmental and earth kind way to approach uh, managing this collection so sorry i'm just going to take a drink of water because i'm talking a lot <laughs> So we, again, we wanted to move away from this notion of um, rose monoculture, which is completely susceptible to disease. If one rose gets something, it goes through, um, you know, the entire collection. You know, the, probably the most famous uh, monoculture story about disease is the potato famine, I guess, in, in Ireland. And uh, the challenges that you face if, uh, if you don't have diversity within your, your planting. So, uh, as I mentioned, we wanted to com include some companion plants and, and they're great for including um, or extending the, the season of interest and the range of colours because the companion plants can express colours in the flowers that are like maybe expressed in, in, in rose flowers. Um, we could reduce the monoculture as I've already mentioned in relation to pests and diseases. We decided to include a lot of insectivore companions to encourage beneficial insects into the garden and this will help in our integrated pest management program within the garden and again this helps us to re reduce harmful applications of pesticides fungicides or inorganic fertilizers um, so you're really creating trying to create more of a natural ecosystem and, and let the the good insects um, manage the bad insects uh, and also with, with certain diseases as well. So we included some plants with what we call allelopathic health benefits. And, you know, a great example of that is if you're aware of ornamental onions, they look fantastic. They have those big sort of like umbiliferous purple or white, or in some cases sort of like lime yellow flower heads on. Uh, and they're, they're an ornamental version of, of onions. And if you, you we all know like what onions smell like when, when you chop onions and that smell that's secreted is based on the sulfur microbes that occur in, in onions. And so ornamental onions secrete sulfur microbes into the soil uh, and black spot, the disease that we were talking about earlier, absolutely cannot grow or develop with um, sulfur. So it's a great natural partnership to stop uh, black spot getting into the collection again. So again, a much more natural approach and a, 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 a drastic move away from using any inorganic um, sprays or, you know, applications of inorganic things that we really don't want to be putting on the garden. A really good lesson that I learned through this, I'd never heard about this before, uh, is um, tachinid flies versus Japanese Beetles. So again, when we talk about integrated pest management, um, this is a really, really great example of it. So tachinid flies are, are natural predators of Japanese beetles. Uh, this is what the tachinid fly looks like. It kind of looks, um, you know, a little bit like a, a house fly, but the main difference or the way that you can recognize a tachinid fly is it has these very sharp vertical hairs on it on its abdomen and that's uh, that's a great identification way of you know recognizing a tachinid fly and basically what the female does is she'll fly through the rose garden she'll select a japanese beetle 
she'll oviposit one or two of these white eggs onto the onto the exoskeleton of the Japanese beetle. And within about 24 hours, the, the eggs hatch, the larva emerge, and uh, the larva eat the way into the into the beetle. So they, they eat the beetle from the uh, outside in. So it's a, quite a, <laughs> a gruesome way for the beetle to die, but it's a, it's a natural predator, the taconid fly. And again, it doesn't you know, require us to use any non or like artificial methods of trying to control this pest. So, um, and they live outdoors all year. You won't find them in your house. Um, they don't do any damage to anything. They're just generally good, good um, insects to, to have in your garden. So, um, and one of the things that we've done with the, the companion fountain is we've planted things like parsley and cilantro, dill and fennel, angelica and the alliums that I just mentioned, because all of these plants have these umbiliferous flowers um, and that really attracts tachinid flies. So we, we've made some considerable you know, choices to include these plants to, to bring these beneficial insects again. And again, move us away from using artificial ways of, of controlling problems in the garden. So, you know, in a, in a quick nutshell, the, the results of the remake of this garden, moving from the, the, the unsustainable model of the rose garden that we had before to a resilient rose garden that we have now is that we have a, an earth kind rose collection that's better for the environment. Um, we're not using, um, you know, chemicals or any of that bad stuff. We're trying to create a uh, its own ecosystem in that garden, and um, that's going really well. Um, we've got a garden with a long season of interest beyond rose bloom time, so you know that's great for visitors coming and wanting to see something beautiful beyond just the roses. We have a more sustainable, resilient, and vigorous garden. We have a garden that maximizes energy and materials conservation. So, you know, I mentioned that we can audit the use of, of water that we use, um, which is great. So we can do like water reports. And actually the, the garden did win a, a sustainability award, I guess it was in 2018, which was wonderful. And we've created a compelling and informative interpretive story about modern and sustainable rose gardens. So, and that's one of the things that I'm most proud about is that uh, there are so many takeaway messages with this garden um, that we can share with our supporters and visitors and guests that uh, hopefully that, that this garden can change. It's got some take home messages that can change the way people garden their own home gardens. And this could, you know, have some like really great benefits for, for across all of Ontario and reducing carbon footprints and environmentalism and not using, you know, pesticides and fungicides. And uh, hopefully it has uh, huge benefits for, for wildlife as well, because it's not, degrading the environment. So, it's, so there's a lot of take home messages with this garden that are really, really, really um, compelling and wonderful. So this is just a, a slide to give you an overview of how um, the color scape in the garden looks. So, you know, in this central area, we have all the, the hot shades and on the outside, we've got more of the pastel or yellow kind of shades. So it's, again, going back to this notion of like, pleasing transitions through the garden. And these are some of the companion plants that we've put in the garden, just so that you've got uh, an idea of how these plants may look with roses. This is the, um, this is what I was referring to by the umbiliferous flower head. So these, these types of flowers will really attract the tachinid flies. Um, we've got quite a few um, you know, cultivated varieties of plants in here, but we've also included um, several uh, native plants as well. So you can see the Asclepius tuberosa here. And this, this is an absolutely wonderful plant at bringing in um, native insects and native um, species, it brings in butterflies. Uh, and so one, one of the great joys with this garden is um, not just seeing the roses and the plants, but the, there's a huge amount of Lepidoptera that occur in the garden as well due to the the planting plants. Uh, we've got some native bars as well, such as uh, Solidago Golden Fleece, which is a really pretty little plant. And uh, all in all, you know, th this color scheme 
you know, really complements the roses, the, the morphology of the plants, the habit of the plants really complements the, the roses. So we've got something that's just a, a lot more interesting on the eye out there. Uh, one of the really, really exciting things that we did last year, which we're hoping to continue this year, is we employed um, a student from the University of Guelph, and this is this is Christine McPherson, and she's a, a, a U of G biomedical science program with a specialism in entomology, which is um, the study of insects. And so, you know, we've been talking about the use of companion plants in the garden and hopefully bringing in beneficial insects and the beneficial insects helping to control some of the pest insects. Um, and it's easy to say that, but how can you prove it? How can you prove that the decision making that you've made and the, and the maintenance decisions that you've made are actually bringing in the results that you want to, to bring in? So the, the whole of last summer, um, Christine went through the garden placing sticky traps and she was um, foliage tapping and she was doing opportuni opportunistic um, sweep netting and you can see the, the netting hands here. So she'd go through and try to catch insects randomly and, and then she would identify them. And so by the end of the summer, she developed a, an insect inventory of uh, a lot of insect species that were in the garden. She created a field guide um, for us because none of us are entomologists. So to have, a, have an insect field guide would be really beneficial for us. She created a, a pin collection for us so that we've actually got, um, it's like a museum collection of insects now so that we could use that for identification purpose, purposes. And we really wanted to to understand the life cycle of this particular pest, which is the um, large rose sawfly. So we've had problems with this in the past. We, we wanted to understand more about its life cycle. And of course, nature being fickle, the one year that we employed Christine, there was no outbreak of the, the sawfly. So she didn't get to do that, unfortunately, but this is, this is a pest that we really need to understand more about. But one of the interesting things here is um i don't know if you can see this area here there's a little egg there on the outside of the caterpillar which would suggest that there's a parasitic wasp that's in the rose garden that's using uh, that's laying its eggs on the on the sawfly so there is a predator in the rose garden that will help control this so we need to do some more research into this uh, but that's very promising. Uh, and again, that would be down to the, the choice of companion plants, I think, that we've included in the garden and, and the, the beneficial insects it brings in. Uh, I just wanted to mention as well that uh, included in the rose garden, we've included a number of Canadian rose hybrids because um, it, would be, <laughs> it would be wrong not to have Canadian selections in there. And so we've been working with uh, Vineland Research Station and um, you know, over the last several years, they've introduced these two plants called Canadian Shield and Chinook Sunrise, which are part of what they call the 49th parallel collection of roses that they're particularly marketing. And these roses are extremely black spot resistant. Um, they grow well in the local climate. They've been hybridized just down the road in the Niagara Peninsula. Uh, and these, these plants are doing really, really well in the garden. Um, They've got a new rose coming out this year. The name is going to escape me now, but we'll be uh, acquiring that for the garden as well. So the, these roses have been specially selected for, for all these good reasons uh, that in how we're trying to, trying to grow the rose garden. And so we were, um, th this was a, 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 an artist's representation of what the rose garden would look like. And this, this was, you know, computer generated around about 2017, you know, and, and through the construction process, you know, you kind of look at this and you think, oh, blimey, it'd be, a, be amazing if it ended up looking like that, you know, because all we had at the time were the paths and the beds waiting to be planted. Uh, and it just, just looked like a kind of barren landscape. So th this was sort of like looking into the future and saying, if we could achieve this, this would be like really, really exactly what we want and something spectacular. So um this is what the garden looked like when it was planted in 2018 and this was in may uh so that this was brand new it's maybe only been planted by a week uh and then in 2022 this is what it looked like 
uh, so very very spectacular and starting to look like the um, you know that computer generated image. So uh, you know the the rose garden's really really come on. It's grown really well. It's growing resiliently. Everything's growing in balance. The integrated pest management and the 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 ecosystem that we've tried to create in there is like really functioning well so it's a really really new way to to manage your rose garden so we're really 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 pleased with the way that it's going and you know um excuse me in in the whole time that the rose garden's been in since 2018 we haven't applied one single chemical application which is another thing i'm really proud about so the garden is very very resilient and it's looking after itself and, and it's thriving which is which is very very exciting so another thing on top of everything I've talked about, just to prove that we're doing the right thing, is that every year we do a rose evaluation, and we do six. Oh, sorry, we do five of those a year, starting from um, June all the way through to October, because that's the bloom season for the roses that we've selected. They bloom for an extremely long time. They bloom from June really right through to the to the first serious frost. And we're evaluating them for black spot resistance, bloom amount and landscape value and fragrance value. Because one of the exciting things about these new roses is they're having fragrance hybridized back into the into the flowers. So there are several roses out in the garden that um, really, really smell unbelievably good. <laughs> and can you believe I have a job that I have to go out and smell over 350 roses for one day every month for five months? Amazing. So yeah, so we evaluate the roses every month and um, the roses that uh, score five or less are roses that are candidates for replacement because they're not resilient and they're not sustainable enough for the, for the garden. It's very rare to get a, a nine or 10 rating, you know, superior rose, nature is never perfect, but we have a lot of roses that are scoring eight to nine, seven to eight and six to seven. So we've got a lot of really, really, really resilient rose material in the garden combined with that um, companion plant, uh, base of plants that are really bringing in and helping us to manage uh, the garden in a more sustainable way. So there's a, as I said, there's a really, really awesome, um, you know, ecosystem kind of thing going on in that garden, which we which we need to research more to make it even more resilient. So again, this is something I'm, I'm very proud of. And at some point, we hope to all, all the information that we're taking from this, we hope to put in the public domain so that anybody who's interested in growing roses can make really sustainable rose selections and companion plant selections and introduce that ecosystem kind of thought process of gardening into the own garden, which can only be great for the environment here in Ontario. These are some of the roses that are scoring the, the highest and most of these are available from Palatine roses or JC Becker and Sons roses, which are both of those companies are down in the in the Niagara Peninsula. A particular favorite of mine, because I always get asked this, is uh, this rose here, Earth Angel. It's got this unique kind of flower form. It kind of almost looks like a, a peony, not a rose. The scent on it is divine. It's absolutely fantastic. It's really, really sustainable. It gets hardly any black spot. It flowers throughout the year, and it's just a real, real winner of a rose. Another really good one is this selection here, Poseidon. Um, it's got a very unusual flower form, a very unusual color for a rose. It's extremely black spot resistant, uh, but not so so strong a fragrance, but it does bloom all the way through the season. And for, a, for a, what we call a, um, uh, a lilac colored rose, this is very unusual because a lot of lilac colored rose flowers, the plants tend to be very, very black spot prone. So again, we're, we're able to include some colors in the garden that normally um, might not be in there. So very exciting. These are some new additions that we put in 2021. We haven't planted much through the pandemic because obviously, um, you know, plants are, are hard to come by and everybody's been <laughs> managing the gardens in slightly unusual, more different ways than pre-pandemic. Um, so, but these were some other ones that we, we did put in and, and Lion's Fairy Tale and Fire Opal in particular are showing a huge amount of promise for being extremely sustainable roses. They're in that eight to nine mark uh, rose evaluation rating. So, 
you know, again, if you're a if you're a rose enthusiast and you're watching this presentation, these would be great for your garden without having to apply chemicals and just letting them grow and do their own thing whilst looking extremely beautiful. So this is plant nerd stuff. So, but this is just a representation of different hybridizers that we we have in the in the garden. So as you can see, there's a lot of um, Canadian hybridizers represented in the garden. So which is which is really great. Um, and then I just really want to talk to you about, we're getting to the end of the slide deck now. So this is, this is what the garden looks like around about August time. Um, so you can, you can see there's a huge amount of plant diversity in here. You can see roses here, there are roses there, there are roses through there and through there. Um, then we've got lavender, we've got the persicaria, we've got verbena, the, the verbena in particular is a hot spot for monarch butterflies and other lepidoptera so this is a great inclusion in the garden uh, so you can you can see this plant diversity and how interesting it on the eye it is but also the value of the fact that the roses are, are, are flowering profusely all the way through the year and all these companion plants are really bringing in beneficial insects and breaking up that monoculture so that black spot can't take off so that you know bad pest outbreaks hopefully as of yet touch wood have not occurred and it's just a it's just a thriving thriving um garden area and it, and it looks really great on the eye and it's aesthetically pleasing and beautiful imagine back to that slide i showed you with the the rose that had no leaves on it and distorted flowers and looked absolutely awful this this is the antithesis of that so we're really really proud of this uh, and again, some companion plants here is the verbena. I mean, this is a lovely way to, to, to plant, you know, the, the verbena just growing through the, this particular rose cultivar called Distant Drums. Uh, it, it looks great on the eye. Uh, you can see how the color of the verbena picks up the, the color of the rose and complements the, the other colors of the rose. So, you know, this is a very, very um, exciting color and plant combination for me. And especially, you know, unfortunately, there's no <laughs> no butterflies on this because I, I will show you a, a slide in a second. But uh, and again, another one. Um, again, you can see how the, the 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 companion plant is picking up the the color of the rose. It's really nice how the the. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the companion plant's name now. Um, but it, it's really nice how it uh, grows through the rose and doesn't overtake it. So just a really nice looking combination on the eye for me. And again, the, the verbena. So, you know, one of the great things about this um, garden is, as I mentioned earlier, is is the, it's not just the plants, it's the entire bio, biodiversity content of this garden. It's, we've, we've got birds in here. Uh, one of the things we've been thinking about is putting bat boxes out there to encourage bats at night for pest control. We've got a whole, um, diversity of Lepidoptera out there, you know, so there, there are certain times in August when you can walk out in the in the rose garden and uh, there's just clouds of, of Lepidoptera and it's just, it's just incredible to see and the, the verbena here in particular, um, the, the monarchs love it as a nectar source, but it also provides a really awesome landing platform for them so they can take a rest and, you know, do whatever they need to do. So it's a really valuable plant for the garden. Um, one of the other biodiversity success stories that we've had is that because um, we replaced the soil and the soil's like really um, healthy, we're now getting um, turtles coming out of Hendry Valley, uh, female turtles coming up out of the valley and laying their eggs in the in the rose garden. And, and so around about um, August, early September, we get the baby turtles that hatch and you know what what a success story to to talk about these these turtles are species at risk uh and uh are endangered and they're using our rose garden to as a as a biodiversity lifeboat i guess so that that's a that's a, i think that's a wonderful testament to to how this garden's being managed and um the benefits that it's bringing because i, I know not all people think that gardens and cultivated plants uh bring um, environmental benefits but um let me assure you that in a lot of cases they do and this is a is a great example of that so what a what a success story that is and so that's sort of the end of my presentation this is a great shot of how the garden looks around about uh, mid-october uh 
we had we didn't even think about how the garden might look with autumn color in the background but you can see that just everything looks stunning in this picture and again you know to say this is october you can you can see the the, the healthy growth and how, how magnificent the garden looks so thank you very much for listening i will stop sharing my presentation and if anybody has any questions i would be happy to answer them Oh, thank you so much. I, I think this gives hope to all those rose growers out there <laughs> that you can do it sustainably. Yeah. <laughs> we do have a number of questions. Um, sure. So, uh, number one, what material do you use for the mulch? Ah, this is a really this is a really good question. So it's just it's just cedar mulch. It's common cedar mulch. It's not dyed. It's just the natural product. Um, We've got some anecdotal evidence to suggest that um, dyed mulches cannot be particularly beneficial for ground dwelling insects. Uh, we don't know what those dyes are putting into the soil either. So we just try to use the most um, natural product as possible. And it's sourced locally. It's not any special product. It's just what's available to us. And we, we put it on every spring to a layer of three inches. And over the season, then it degrades and it puts that fertility back into the soil. Uh, we have a question. So at the beginning of the presentation, you said you replaced the soil. So how, what kind of soil did you use and how deep did you have to? Right, so we replaced the soil to a depth of 18 inches site wide. And there's, there's a, so this is an interesting thing. Rosarians either believe in rose replant disorder or they don't. It's it's a it's a fifty fifty thing, right? And I've been out to speak to rose societies, and it's always the same. It's put up your hands if you believe in rose replant disorder, and fifty percent put their hands up, and fifty percent don't. So, but anecdotally, when when I was a when I was a student, I, I had that drummed into me that so you should always replace the soil, uh, and eighteen inches is, is is kind of a compromise depth because it that's good for the rose root, but it's obvious it's also if you excavate deeper it adds more to the budget of having to replace it. So it was somewhere in the compromise budget figure to do that. And um, sorry, what was the other part of the question? Uh, just what type of soil did you use? So, so our landscape architect um, sourced the soil and it, and it basically came from a building site somewhere, I think it was up in, in, in Walterdown in, in that area. Um, but before it was decided to use that soil, it had soil testing done on it for pH and nutrients. And, and, and it was found that the soil was extremely suitable for, for roses. So, so it was like local provenance from a building site with several checks to make sure that it was okay. So because you add that mulch all the time, do you need fertilizers? Because we do have a question about uh, uh, does it say, do you have any tips for fertilizing? Or, and then we have a new one about, do you um, do you have any natural fertilizers that you use? Right, so th those two questions segue into each other and they're, and they're great, great partner questions. So um, we planted in 2018 and we're going into 2023. So we haven't used any fertilizers yet at all. So all, all the growth that you saw in the, in the pictures on the slide deck, that's all from just um, replacing the soil and also um, applying the mulch, which degrades and, and adds that nutrient. But I think like moving forward, we are going to have to think about using um, feeding the roses and, and the, the kind of products that we're looking at are all organic products. So in, in particular, seaweed products, they're meant to be very good for, um, for soil fertility. Uh, and that, that that can be applied either as a soil drench or a foliar drench, so it has a it has a double kind of like function. So that that's really good. Um, so we'll be we'll be looking at that in in years coming up. There's also um, I'm going to forget the name. I'm having, I'm having a senior day today. Like n names are just going in and out of my head. Um, I, I I can forward this on to you, Helen. Like when I when I um, when I remember it, but it, it's basically a German product and it. And it's uh, it's a wheat product, so it's completely organic, uh, and you can you can use it as a soil drench, and it it makes uh, how can I describe this? It makes the plants more robust. So it's not necessarily a fertilizer, but there's something in it that really beefs up the robustness about the plants. So that might be be another thing that we can consider 
use them in the future but it, whatever we use it will only be organic stuff it won't be you know fake fertilizer or stuff that's going to run off down into the into Henry Park so as, as natural as possible right and would you be able to use mushroom compost or is that a no-no around yeah like, yeah one of the things that we actually thought about was was mushroom compost um with mushroom compost it can slightly alter the ph of the soil it's it's maybe a little more uh difficult to get hold of unless you have a regular supplier the seed of mulch to us after we looked at all this seemed to be the easiest product to get but i think you could also use um well rotted manure that would be a good alternative um you could use cocoa shell fiber uh, you could use coir there's a whole range of you know naturally occurring mulches that you could use and i think you know, if you put it onto that layer of three inches, it would have major benefits in the same way that the power mulch is. So. And, and somebody else mentioned worm castings. Right, that would be another awesome option. And um, that that's something I would like to explore more right across the collections here at RBG. And, and just to go back to another product that we thought about using, and I think I'm hoping this is something we're going to start to experiment with this year is, um, compost tea mm -hmm. so i know i know a guy who's a scientist who's been working on this and he, and he showed me some of the results of what he's been getting with the product that he uses and it's really quite astounding and it not only feeds the plants it reduces the incident of pest attacks as well so uh, that's something we'll definitely be following up on great we'll keep in touch then <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, somebody wanted to know if chives can act in the same way as ornamental onions to control. Chive, them. Yeah, chives would be a great choice, and um, we were we were going to put them in, but for some reason we didn't. But um, yes, chives would be equally as good as all the other um, plants in the onion family. And oh, we have lots of questions, <laughs> not a lot of time, so I'm trying to get them all in. Um, are these collections repeat bloomers? Yeah, so they they. Peak, peak bloom is around about, so the first rose to bloom is like about the, the third week of May. Peak bloom for the collection is around about the second and third week of June. They take a break in July and then they bloom again through August, September and October. So, and they, they'll bloom all the way through to the to the first frost. So all, we have one or two old fashioned roses in the garden that only bloom once during the season but i would say that like um 98 of the roses in the garden will re-bloom through the season and for any of your average roses the ones that didn't uh, score as well um yeah. will you replace those uh yeah and if so what did, what would you replace them with do you know the the cultivars yet yeah, so th this is the ultimate irony. You know, I'm, I'm originally from the UK and I moved here in 2006. And one of the things that we did was plant a number of English roses in the garden. And they're all the ones that don't do very well at all. So <laughs> it's, it's I ironic, right? So we, we have we have about seven or eight um, David Austin cultivars in the garden that just I don't think they like the humidity of the summer here, and, and they are very black spot prone. Um, so they've been identified as candidates for removal using the evaluation system that we used. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that we might be able to replace them in, in fall this year or like spring next year. It's just because of the pandemic and the access to plant material, it, it's been a little tricky. Um, plus, um, We've been trying to work with a consultant, Peter, and he's not been able to come up either because of travel restrictions. And then he had, um, he had a couple of reasons he couldn't come up this summer. But yeah, we'll definitely be replacing stuff moving forward. Uh, and then speaking of the heat affecting, so how has climate change affected your roses? Because somebody here has found that their Explorer rose suffered from the heat. Yeah, right. So that's that's a really good question. I think, you know, that that's probably a longer term question. So what, one of the things that we did was um, uh, earlier in the slide deck, I, I mentioned this notion of the, the graft union on the plant. So, you know, roses are propagated by taking a rootstock and a scion and, and grafting them together. Um, so one of the things that we did was we planted that graft union two inches below soil surface, and then we put the three inch layer of mulch on top. So essentially it's five inches below 
grade. And so what that does is it makes the rose roots grow deeper, but it also protects that graft union from, from cold in winter. And because it, it prevents from um, drying out as well in the summer. So if you, if you plant your roses where the graft union is two inches lower, that should, you know, technically help with hotter weather and colder winters. So that might, might you know, help with climate change. And, you know, when, when you think about roses as well, um, you know, depend, going back to those older classes of roses, you know, some of those are, are quite well adapted because they come from tough growing conditions. So it's, it's all about rose selection, which is one of the good things about this garden, because you can, you can look at the rose cultivars in our garden and see which are doing well and which aren't and make some informed choices. I just uh, a couple more questions and then I will we will have to let Alex go. <laughs> um, somebody wants to know, um, do you have any recommendations for um, books for rose garden landscape design? Because some of those landscape design photos were just stunning. Like, do you have any? Yes. So, um, the Peter Kukelski book um, is, is, is really, that's the current rose Bible. So it, it's, it's not so much about design. It's, it's about rose selection. Um, so, you know, again, what, what I could, what I could sort of like promote is like Peter's book is great. I, I use it all the time. I'm not, I'm not trying to sell you junk. It, it, I, I use it all the time. If, if ever I can't find it, I go into a panic. Um, and then if you, if you look at the, the combinations in the RBG Rose Garden, you know, that, that one of the takeaway messages with that is like, the, the companion plants and how they grow and look with with the roses so um i don't i don't know the person who asked that question if they're able to visit rbg um uh, but i think that would be uh for, from a design context that might be helpful so perfect um when you do replace the roses um do you treat the soil if there has been a disease or and then do you just you take out all 18 inches put in your new rows and then top up again so that that's a really that's a really good question and i've been thinking about this myself so you know up until now we've just been planting back into the same soil because it's really fertile and, and really everything seems to be taken and doing really well so again you know rose replant disorder does it exist or not but the um the product i was just talking about the name of which I can't remember the, the, the wheat product. Um, they recommend that for, for um, irrigating new roses when you plant them because it's helped to maybe negate rose replant disorder. It, it may be that, um, you know, moving further downstream that we may re replace the soil or it, or it may be, and I, I don't even want to think about this because it's like a lot of work, but it may be that if, you know, we might replace an entire bed in its entirety. So just do the whole thing from scratch all over again. It's going to depend on the size of the bed, how much needs replacing and what the impact of that will be. So that, that's a work in progress for me because I, I, I'm not a Rosarian and I've lived and learned through this product and I'm a pro, uh, project and I'm still learning. So mm -hmm. does that person have any good answers? Cause I'll, I'll take any answers that they've got for this. <laughs> Just a question right now. Yeah, I think everybody's on the same page. <laughs> um, just one last question. Um, oh, someone just wanted to verify. So yes. the, the roses without is, chemicals. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the book. Yeah. Um, perfect. Thank you for Katie for putting that into the chat. Just one last question. When are the roses pruned? So another good question. So um, what we normally do is we, we, have a, we have a policy where we don't prune anything back after about the first week of September. Um, because as with any plant, if you prune it, it encourages new growth. So you don't want to be encouraging new growth sort of, you know, just as the cold weather's coming. So we don't do anything after September. We'll, we'll give them a prune in spring, depending. So, you know, every year is different. So last last winter was the first serious cold year that they went through. So there was a bit of like winter damage. So they, they got a slightly more severe pruning. So most of the pruning is done in spring, um, probably around about 
late March, early April. Um, we, we, that, now, this is fascinating. This is something I didn't realize as well. But um, obviously, after flowering, we go around and deadhead because, you know, you take the old flower heads off, it'll produce more bloom. But there are, there are a whole series of roses now that are called self-cleaning roses. And I've never heard of this before. I didn't know what it was. But um, so, so basically, the roses are sterile. So the flowers, when they bloom, they won't produce seeds. So well, once the flowers bloom, the flower just falls off. So it's, it's a self-deadheading rose, which is awesome. <laughs> so and we selected those because it's less work, right? So but the, the, the main the main pruning is in is in spring. Uh, we may do some sort of aesthetic pruning, you know, to remove like something that's a broken stem or something or something that's at eye level as you're walking through the garden, because that's a health and safety thing. But mo most of the pruning is done in spring. Perfect. Well, thank you again for joining us. This has been a great talk. And like I said, it's given a lot of these people who are joining us today some, some hope for growing roses in their garden that we can do it sustainably, which is you know, our, our goal, our mission and, uh, and RBG's mission. So yeah. <laughs> great that you could share that with us today. Yeah, and, and thank you for inviting me because it's always like really great to speak to, to your group. And uh, it's just always an honor to be able to be invited to this. So thank you very much. And I really appreciate all the cool questions. Yeah, yeah, this is a very <laughs> engaged group. Thank you. Um, join us at 2 p.m. We'll have a talk by Manny from HEN and it will be El Jardin. I'm learning how to pronounce that because it is Spanish, not French, which I did earlier. So <laughs> <laughs> naughty for me, but uh, thank you very much. And we will see everybody at two. Thank you. Bye. Bye.